by the League of American Bicyclists in 2013, based on the town's sustained commitment to cycling. The LAB stated in its report that Princeton has room to grow, but that notable steps are being made in the right direction. Retaining bronze or moving up to silver depends on key measures, including implementing a safe routes to school plan that emphasizes bicycling for all elementary, middle, and high schools, and an expansion of the bike network, providing a convenient and comfortable cycling environment, welcoming to cyclists of varying ages and skill levels. Under the Complete Streets philosophy, pedestrians, bicyclists, transit users, and motorists are fully and equally considered during the planning and design process. Princeton has an opportunity now to expand its bike network by installing its first pair of dedicated bike lanes. This could be a first step toward providing linkages between neighborhoods, the downtown, schools, parks, and the Princeton Shopping Center, and our neighboring towns. According to the League of American Bicyclists, increased street connectivity is associated with more walking, biking, and transit use due to greater directness of travel and more route choice options. On a neighborhood street such as Hamilton, the public roadway can be designed to benefit the greatest number of, and variety of users rather than preserved for convenient free parking, which benefits a much smaller number of residents. Princeton has been talking about creating a bike master plan which will consider complete streets treatments for many of our roadways. The current opportunity for bike lanes should not be discarded because the master plan has not yet been adopted. Our town's leaders should show their commitment to complete streets now if the recommendations of the Traffic and Transportation Committee and the Pedestrian and Bicycle Advisory Committee are ignored at this point, how are we to trust that a consultant's recommendations will be taken seriously in the planning of future road projects? I strongly recommend taking into account the greater public good, installing our first dedicated bike lanes, and taking this important step toward creating a useful bike network. Thank you. Hello, I'm John Penrod. I <clears throat> live on Stewart Road West, and I'd like to speak on behalf of the, uh, the bicycle lane on Hamilton Avenue, as well as uh, uh, provide support for the complete streets policy of Princeton. Uh, I've lived on and off in Princeton for about 25 years, and as you all know, traffic has gotten considerably worse over that time period. Um, I have a couple of friends whose lives have been strongly marked by bicycle accidents in Princeton, and I've been safe so far myself. But um, I'm regarded by people my age, which is not young, as rather intrepid uh, cycling around. I also drive and, and walk. And uh, I think a pretty large section of, of Princeton uh, is afraid of cycling in this town. And I think that speaks volumes about the quality of life. Um, although it's high, it could be higher if people felt free to move about um, on a bicycle and felt safe. And I think that a separate bike lane is really part of that. And I think this next, the, the Hamilton uh, proposed lane is one step in a more extensive network of bike lanes in Princeton to connect all the important nodes between employment and where people live. Thank you. I'm David Cohen, and uh, I am a member of the PBAC. Uh, I'm here tonight to support the bike lanes on Hamilton Ave. I have just a couple of comments. Um, one is that I live on Terhune Road, and I don't remember if it was in Patrick's list of roads that are slated for improvements. But I'm telling you right now, Council, that if you will introduce an ordinance to remove the on-street parking in front of my house, which I use regularly, I will have a big kiss for each and every one of you when it passes. <laughs> I just think it's that important that we be providing um, better bicycling facilities in town. And it's not just for the cyclists. It really is for the motorists as well. Uh, another comment that I have is there is no better feeling, actually, than riding through town on a shoulder, zipping past the cars that are stuck in traffic. I mean, I would love to hog that feeling for myself, um, but I realize that's selfish, and I think I should share it uh, with other cyclists. And by the way, it's 
been well documented in New York City that post introduction of Mayor Bloomberg's bike lanes, that not only are bicyclists making their way more safely and more quickly around the city, but travel times for car trips have declined. So this is the basis on which we say that having good bike facilities in a town, do not, it's not just for the bicyclists, it's for everybody. And I would say to the residents of Hamilton, uh, have here that to focus on you know whether there are accidents on your stretch of road in this one location um, is really kind of myopic I mean if we can get bicyclists off Nassau Street because we provided decent bike facilities on Hamilton Wiggins we have to look at the decrease in accidents on Nassau Street as well I mean this is a community-wide uh, issue and we can't be focused uh, on this as a neighborhood by neighborhood thing. The last comment I'll make is that I think everybody needs to think about really what we're talking about here. We're talking about the public right of way and I want you to think about those three words. It's public, it's a right that's granted to all the members of the public, and it's intended as a wayfaring path. It's not intended to be obstructed. There are circumstances in which on-street parking makes sense for the community when it serves the entire community, when it's in the center of town and it serves merchants by allowing shoppers to come and patronize their establishments, when it serves people who live on the outskirts of town and lets them drive in to use the public amenities in town. This is not that instance. The on-street parking here is a private good that is being claimed by the residents of the street really solely on the basis that they've always had it, not that they have any intrinsic right to a piece, to obstruct a piece of our right of way. Thank you. Hello, I'm Steve Cruz, 20-year resident of Cedar Lane. I'm the chair of the PBAC. Not necessarily an enviable task right now, but I'm here to represent uh, not my neighbors, not people in my household, not my kids who have moved away to go to college, but I'm here to represent the unknown and faceless people who might want to travel by bicycle around here, the people who actually found it intolerable and opted out of bicycling altogether when they were teenagers or youths and therefore miss out on a lifetime activity. And I'm, I'm here to represent the faceless person I saw crossing the ridge on 206 this morning at 8.30 in the morning when it was about 12 degrees Fahrenheit outside. And I think we've all seen those people on 206. I'm, I'm here to represent that person who I will never know. I'd also like to talk about the so-called bike lane to nowhere. And the next time you hear that slogan, which I'm sure would look good on a t-shirt, I'd like you to ask yourself, where are we going? Is this the bike lane to nowhere, or is it the bike lane to the part of town that has no bike lanes? Or is it the bike lane to nowhere 2015 edition? Um, wheels going round and round. As you probably know, 13 years ago, the town paid $20,000 to produce a bike master plan, which fell flat. So I'm not quite sure how things are going to be different this time around. But it seems like whoever happens to be the chair of the PBAC is going to end up standing right here where I am right now, sometime in the future, saying exactly the same words that were said 13 years ago by Ron Lassard and Mike Suber, who are here in the room. And finally, um, uh, in the interest of time, I think there, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of debate and, and disagreement, but I think there are a few things we can all agree on. Everybody in this room can agree on. There are no bike facilities in the former borough. Speeding is a problem on Hamilton. Intersections are dangerous. And speed bumps are certainly not an option in this town anymore. Uh, that's all I want to say for now. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Nat Bodigheimer. I'm a member of the Traffic and Transportation Committee and a resident of 26, 26 White Pine Lane in the Little Brook neighborhood. 
I support the strongest possible improvements for bicycling on Hamilton Avenue, which in my mind requires a bike lane solution. I sympathize with the concerns of neighborhood residents who have spoken against bike lanes, including their calls for networks of improvements as opposed to their one-off projects, their desire to learn of plans as early in the process as possible, and their appeal for quantitative data and metrics to judge progress towards biking and walking goals. I also appreciate the strong general expressions of support for bicycling from so many Hamilton residents who've testified uh, last week and again this evening. But fundamentally, I believe as a community that we need to take the strongest possible steps to make our streets appealing as possible for bicycling, including not just for the very experienced bicyclists who have testified uh, that there is no need for lanes on Hamilton, but also for the more tentative who want to bicycle but who don't feel safe doing so. I count my daughter, a 10th grader at PHS, among these latter, someone who turns right at Hamilton to bike up the sidewalk on Snowden because Hamilton is so uncomfortable and Snowden is so narrow and pinched. We've heard testimony that parked cars are necessary to calm traffic, but there are simply not enough cars parked along Hamilton to provide that calming. We've also heard testimony that speeding on Hamilton is a problem today, even with the protection the parked cars are supposed to provide. We've heard testimony that bike lanes are not necessary because there are no bicycle riders in evidence, but to my mind this is the evidence that street conditions are uncomfortable for just those people who would like to bicycle, but who don't. We've heard testimony that no one will bike from uh, mega mansions. We haven't heard this testimony this evening, but uh, last week, uh, from the mega mansions in the Little Brook neighborhood, but houses don't bicycle, people bicycle. And the four children who live next door to me and who go to Little Brook today will eventually either bike to JW and PHS or be driven. We've also heard testimony that repaving Hamilton with bike lanes would not make sense because bike lanes transitioning to showers would be useless. But we would never make the same comment about roads whose profiles change constantly to suit different particulars, and with which change we are completely comfortable. It's not any different with bicycle improvements. A useful bicycle network can and should consist of many different elements, and a bike lane is not invalid if it connects to something with a different design. Whatever the outcome on this particular proposal, the public debate about Hamilton Avenue has been useful and has shined a light on many of the difficulties of making bicycle improvements in Princeton on an ad hoc basis. So in addition to urging the council to approve the strongest possible measures to improve bicycling on Hamilton Avenue, I would also ask that the council agree to advance a program that so much testimony has agreed upon, whichever side you're on. Adopt quantitative goals for bicycling and walking to give teeth to the town's qualitative statements of policy support. Adopt a town-wide plan for a network of bicycle improvements and a multi-year schedule for implementing those improvements. And engage schools, parents, student bicyclists, and residents of affordable housing communities in that planning. And finally, collaborate with the university and neighboring jurisdictions to promote bicycle investments that could really make a difference, for example, between Nassau Street and Princeton Junction. And finally, get, actually, that wasn't final, this is finally, get people bicycling. Study after study shows that people who bicycle feel safer in the company of other cyclists, and in fact, statistically are safer when more people bicycle. Thank you very much. Good evening, my name's George Cohen. I live on Hawthorne Avenue. My, gr uh, my driveway and my backyard faces Hamilton Avenue. For 20 years, I've had to back out into Hamilton Avenue every morning to get to work. And I can tell you that's no easy task. I've ridden my bike for 20 years throughout town. I ride on Hamilton Avenue all the way up Wiggins into town and back. And I can tell you, the number one concern for me as a bicyclist is the speed of cars. And the only thing that slows down the speed of cars there are parked cars. They slow them down on Hamilton between Linden and Harrison. And I can tell you that riding to Snowden Lane, that part of the uh, street that's being under consideration here is actually one of the safer areas. It's wider than it is between Harrison and Linden. The parked cars make a difference. I know the police try their best. They have a lot of things to do. The, the traffic there is really going at 40 to 45 miles an hour. It's unbelievable. It's unsafe for children to cross. And taking away parking on that street not only impacts that neighborhood and the elderly people who may live there, but it also makes it more unsafe for bicyclists. The people who are sideswiped going on Hamilton Avenue is because cars are going fast, not slow. And I think that if you take away that parking, you're making it more unsafe 
And I think that you'd have to take into consideration, I heard on the affordable housing plan, one of the reasons you can't put affordable housing in some places is because of parking. Well, I think the people who live there have a right to park there too. The repair people have to come to their house, have a right to park there. And I think that this plan should be voted down and reconsidered. Thank you. My name is Ron Lessard. I live on Birch Avenue. The allocation of parking in Princeton is, a, is, is not a story about fairness. Some of us can park in front of our houses, some of us cannot. It is a story about public property, about shared property, and how it is used affects all of us. We've been trying to promote, bike, promote bicycling in this community for decades. The planning board itself, in the early 2000s, and you all know about this, looked at a very thorough and all-encompassing circulation plan for bicycling for insertion into our master plan. It was never adopted. I was told because it involved the removal of parking spaces. That was years ago. Today, we have a complete streets policy and a master plan that seeks to make our town more bicycle friendly at its very core. Lanes along Hamilton are recommended by our advisory committee as a first step in creating high quality bicycle facilities around town. Does this mean we've reached the tipping point? A point at which our concerns about traffic congestion and the pollution from motor vehicles our health, our welfare, the safety of our bicyclists, and the promotion of alternative forms of transportation have finally trumped our concerns over the loss of a parking lot along a street. In considering lanes along this section, you cannot deny that this very corridor has a long, lies along a path to our frequent destinations our common destinations, the very core that our master plan refers to. Lanes along a stretch like this is the way to generate the greatest, and greatest effect and cause more of us to use an alternative, namely a bicycle. Hamilton leads to the downtown and the library. It connects our schools. It is classified as a major collector. Installing lanes here would act towards reducing trips by fossil fuel burning vehicles. This is a real opportunity to meet the goals we've already enumerated in our master plan. You can debate the installation of bike lanes all you like, but lanes here on, in, on Hamilton would indisputably improve the situation. They would create space where there currently is none. Motorists, bicyclists, and pedestrians alike would travel simultaneously, each in their own space even during rush hour. Intersections would still present a problem. It seems bikes, bicyclists are wearing Harry Potter's cloak of invisibility when confronted with turning motorists. The situation improves, however, as more of us turn to bicycling. The safety that lanes would bring, combined with the perception of safety, would encourage more of us to bicycle, and more bicyclists make drivers more aware. Do we all as a community support this thing? There was a transportation survey run through our school system specifically aimed at finding this out. And my time is up. I hope you had a chance to read it. Liz, did he submit his comments? Yeah, if you'd like to submit your comments to the clerk, they can be made part of the record. Give them to the clerk, they'll be included in the minutes. Hi, uh, my name is Misha Simonov. I'm a senior undergraduate um, at the university. And I wanted to speak to you today on behalf of the students, the thousands of people who, while not being residents of the town per se, um, are an active part of it, and I think should be more a more active part of it than they are. Um, and I moved here from San Francisco, I guess almost four years ago now, um, a city where I bike to school every day on bike lanes. So it was a bit of a shock coming here. but. Um, I love biking, and so I persisted in biking, and I, I bike everywhere here. Um, it sucks a lot of the time. I, uh, I, I have to admit, when I first got honked at, I was, it was it a was pretty, pretty drastic change. I got used to it. Um, 
I, I bike, you know, to the shopping center to take care of things like that. I bike the dentist in West Windsor. It's very difficult, and I think most people think I'm entirely insane. Um, and I think that's ultimately the problem that I want to highlight here, is people are saying, oh, there haven't been accidents on my street. Oh, you know, it's fine. The problem is, like, everybody here who's said I'm a bicyclist practically belongs in this, like, small 10% of people who are okay with biking with things the way they are right now. Um, and the way things are is, while not, you know, as horrible as some kind of giant metropolis superhighways, it's pretty scary, and the vast majority of people do not feel comfortable biking. And last semester, I, I did a study for a class about um, a potential bike share program, and we interviewed a lot of Princeton residents and a lot of students, and almost nobody felt comfortable sort of at Princeton leaving the campus. And we have a lot of student bikers. I'd say, like, at least half the population has a bike or uses one. But nobody takes that bike off campus because it's scary. Nobody really knows how to get anywhere. And there's no bike lanes or markings. And so what that means is not just that the students are sort of only biking on campus. It means they're also frequenting establishments in town a lot less than they could. And a lot of people complain that, oh, Princeton students don't really use the town in a university town way. And part of the problem, I think, is a lot of it is inaccessible. For example, the Princeton Shopping Center is practically impossible to get to um, walking or take, I mean, forget taking the bus. No one has time to do that, to get to the shopping center. When people find out that I bike there, they think I'm totally crazy. So I think it's really, really important to realize this town could be a lot more open to students, but these students can't bike anywhere because they are far too fearful. And so this is, again, as we've said before, a very small step, but a very important one. And I think it's a really important to engage students and faculty, because this is thousands and thousands of people who are using this town, but are not using it in an environmentally sustainable way. They're driving their cars to get to these places, um, or they're not using these resources at all. So um, on behalf of the students, I really urge you to make this a bike-friendly town for students, um, so that when students come here, they know that they can use um, climate-friendly forms of transportation. Thanks. Can I, can I, Liz, can I ask, sir, 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 I'm sorry, so do you have a report from the work you did the, when you said you did some work on r ride sharing and? Um, some of that stuff is fairly informal, but I, I'd be happy to send, um, basically what that went into is a proposal for a bike share um, for Princeton, and actually we talked about the PBAC and sent a copy to the mayor. Um, okay, but great. I'd be happy to forward you a copy as well. Um, Perfect. Yeah. Our, our emails are on the website. That'd be great. Excellent. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Marcy Meixler. I live on Kyler. Um, and I've kept this baby out way too late to talk to you tonight in support of uh, bike lanes. So, um, let's, whoops. Um, Here, I'll just, I'll just, uh, thank you, yes, I appreciate that, thanks very much. So I'm here tonight um, as a member, a founding member of Tykes on Bikes, which is a Princeton-based group um, encouraging people to come out with their families, oops, and, uh, and bike, and as a way of trying to um, help people gain a better um, feeling for safety while they're biking around Princeton. Um, I'm also here as a mom. And um, really what I wanted to speak to you about tonight was um, how having a separate bike lane really helps to, um, for people who are biking around with children or whose children themselves are on bikes feel more safe, where they can feel like they have a separate, a separate area that's, um, that's safe for them aside from where the cars are. And so I have this hope that um, when my daughter is um, of biking age that she'll have um, safe places to bike in these bike lanes. Right now, <clears throat> um, uh, as I bike around town, I, um, I feel like I have, um, like I'm compete a competing a little bit with the cars and that even though I have a trailer, they're not necessarily um, paying as, as much attention to the fact that I have a baby um, <clears throat> along on the bike. So I have this vision and this hope and this dream that in the future, as more streets have bike lanes, it'll be more safer, um, it'll be safer for people who are biking with children and children themselves. So thank you for, uh, for listening and, um, and please take, I, I really hope you'll take this into consideration. Thank you. My name is Catherine Iref. I do not live on Hamilton Avenue. I live on Dodds Lane. Um, I'd like to urge the council to just 
bring the bicycle chevrons all the way down the road and to forget about all this rubbish because it doesn't make sense. When I was going this evening along Nassau Street, they have bicycle chevrons and that made me extra vigilant. When I came back down Hamilton, again there were chevrons and wherever I see them, it makes me much more careful and I think it will make everybody far more considerate. And I really think that we've got a, a crunch with money. It's going to be very expensive. And we could have chevrons all at every single street in town. And nobody would complain so long as you don't take their parking away. The other thing I'd like to say is it won't upset the trees because we're a tree city. And if you start digging the road up and making it wider, it will ultimately affect our trees. So I'd like you to really think hard. And cyclists, if they were a bit more careful, and if they didn't cross the roads when the traffic lights are red, which they do, maybe they would be safe for themselves. Thank you. Hi, my name is Eric Schreiber. I live at uh, 36 Stanley Avenue. Uh, I am definitely in support of the goal to establish uh, an on-street bike network in Princeton. And when I uh, first heard about this ordinance, I was uh, very excited. But I, I live near this segment of Hamilton uh, that's going to be affected by this ordinance. And uh, having uh, talked with some of my neighbors and listened to their comments at, at, at last week's meeting, I have some reservations about uh, the ordinance being passed at this time. I think that they were not given uh, due notice uh, uh, when the ordinance uh, was originally introduced, and I think the meeting last week uh, starts a dialogue that is, is finally constructive, and I think they brought an, a number of uh, valid points uh, that, that should be responded to, and I think Ultimately, a, a lot of them have uh, ready solutions. There was uh, discussions about what will residents do if, if, if they have contractors working on their house. Uh, there's a possible possibility that there could be a permit for something like that. Uh, there was a woman who talked about uh, her father. Uh, she needs to park on Hamilton to help her father uh, get in and out of the house, dis despite the fact that they have a... Um, a driveway, I think, off of Harriet, but a, a, a temporary uh, permit that would allow someone to park short term uh, to assist an elderly person in and out of the house is a possibility. Uh, there's assertions that uh, the parking on the side streets is going to cause uh, new dangers, and I live on one of these side streets. I find maybe some of that suspect, but it, it is it's 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 important to listen to this and and. Um, get a feel for what the real impact would be. I think there are ways to solve uh, problems if the parking to the side streets uh, does, is, if, if there's a lot of parking to the side streets. Um, so I, I, I think if there's a possibility of delaying the ordinance and, and getting some more feedback about the things that were raised, that would be great. The second thing is the, the bike path to nowhere. I, I strongly dislike that phrase. Uh, I think it willfully ignores how Hamilton is uh, part of uh, a main stretch into the center of town. Um, and I think that, that you'd be hard pressed to look at a map of Princeton and not see that this, this, this street is going to be critical for having an on-street, a, a useful on-street uh, set of bike lanes. Uh, but the fact is, I don't, there's, there's no guidance, at least publicly available, that shows that the other part of Hamilton and Wiggins will be um, that we can establish bike lanes both ways without widening the street. So it's hard for me to get behind the ordinance without at least a little bit more information about that. The last thing I would say, though, is I, I think there's a category of arguments that is trying to say, hey, we've had bikers for a long time. We have no problem. We're sharing the streets now. And, and that I disagree with strongly. I think bike lanes will be a, a substantial improvement. It will uh, create... Uh, 
a larger biking population, and I hope ultimately we can find a way to do that. Thanks. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm Andrew Kuntz, freeholder Andrew Kuntz, but perhaps uh, more importantly this evening, I'm the husband of Lori Harmon, who's on the, the PBAC and spoke earlier. Um, I sent all council members a letter get going very thoroughly through my thoughts on this bike lane and this ordinance, and uh, I support this ordinance. Uh, I wanted to go into a little detail, building on uh, the remarks of uh, uh, David Cohen made earlier about parking. Uh, because really what's before you this evening is, a, I believe, a historic opportunity, one not considered by councils in Princeton before, which is you're really being asked to choose. You're not just putting in a bike lane somewhere or establishing parking somewhere. You're asked, being asked to choose this evening what is the more valuable, what is the greatest public good uh, in this particular case. Is it, more, is it more valuable to the public to have parking here on Hamilton, right? or is it more valuable to public to have a bike lane here that provides guarantee to provide a safer route of transportation for a cycle on Hamilton Avenue? Now, perhaps my experience as an elected official and someone who has served on Princeton Borough Council where I understand the importance of on-street parking, but not all on-street parking is created equal and is as equally valuable to a municipality. Clearly, in Princeton, metered on-street parking has got to be the most valuable asset, parking asset that you have in this town. It generates revenue for the municipality. It is important because it provides parking for residents and customers of our downtown. Because it's metered, it ensures that that parking turns over. Again, another benefit for our merchants downtown. Similarly, there is restricted parking that has hourly limits. We all know about that kind of parking as well. Similar benefits. It's for the businesses, it ensures that people don't just sit and park all day on the streets. It ensures a turnover of, of, uh, of a customer base for our downtown. Perhaps the least valuable parking that you're fit, you uh, have in this town is unrestricted on-street parking uh, of the type that we have on Hamilton Avenue here. So if what you're looking at is the least valuable form of parking right, and a uh, something that is a, a definite safety benefit to cyclists. Question is, what will you choose? I suggest you choose the bike lane, but what you do choose will send a, a tremendous message to this community about what, to what extent do you value bikeability in this town. If in all cases, on-street parking trumps bike lanes, if in all cases, regardless of the variety of, of, of on-street parking, you are trumping bike lanes, what does that say as, about you as a governing body about your commitment to bikeability? If you support unrestricted on-street parking here, it sends a clear message to the public that that's what's most valuable. And how we ever achieve bikeability in this town is a good question. If tonight, however, you choose to be that council that does go for a bike lane, that does send a tremendous message that yes, we are ready to make the commitment to make this town a more bikeable and a safer community for cyclists. I thank you for your time. Please vote to support. Good evening. Uh, my name is Donna Palenza. I'm here on behalf of my parents, Gabriel and Michael, uh, Gabriel and Betty Palenza. They live at 305 Hamilton Avenue. Um, my father is 90 years old. My mom is 87. They, they live in a corner lot. Their, their driveway is actually on Harriet Drive. My father recently has a walker. Uh, it's been that way for several months. The only way for him to enter and exit his house is through the front door, which requires him to par us to park on Hamilton Avenue. Um, if this ordinance is passed, it, 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 it worries me how they will stay there and how we will be able to get him in and out of the house. And, you know, we talked earlier about value on parking. Yeah, value on parking is, is very steep for me right now. 
Um, so I'd like you to consider that. When I was here last week, I heard I saw five proposals um, about bicycle lanes and a couple of which kept parking on one side. That, that is a fair compromise. I'm not against bike lanes. What I am concerned about is how that affects the residents on that street if parking is eliminated. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dan Rappaport from Copperwood. And I've heard many arguments pro and con about the safety of the bike lanes. And the one thing that uh, really touched me was the um, statement made last week by one of the town employees, um, Diane Landis, about um, bicycling on the sidewalk on Hamilton Avenue because it was um, perceived as being too unsafe to um, pedal on the street, but the sidewalks weren't made for um, bicycling and in some and downtown we strictly prohibit bicycling on the sidewalk so we don't want to encourage bicycling on the sidewalk elsewhere and the way to um, lessen the um, concern about bicycling on the street is to have bike lanes um, that way um, there's one place for cars and one place for bicyclists traveling in the same direction and um, you have the idea being floated about a three foot passing law in the state of New Jersey so if that were put into effect, that wouldn't be as great of a need to be put into effect if there were a bicycling lane on each side of the street. And I'd also like to say like we spent a lot of money, I presume, on putting out a bicycling map um, last month we haven't had one in quite a while and what's the point of having a bicycling map if people are still going to perceive certain streets to be um, considered to be unsafe and overall there's the economic benefit of that comes about by having bicycling improvements because people from the greater Princeton area will feel more comfortable about using streets with bicycle lanes um, to pedal into town. Thank you. Bill Urian, representing my son, 293 Hamilton Avenue. Uh, the, the ordinance, this, this, is, this is, will be a precedent-setting ordinance. Nowhere in Princeton does this ordinance currently exist. Uh, at the last meeting I got up, I talked a little bit, so I'm not really going to extend it too much, but how many bicycles currently use in this section of the room? You don't know. Right? We know how many cars go down, go down, how many, but nobody's done anything to say how many roads. I heard three bikes, so if we, how are you going to judge if, if the ridership's increased? So if it's up to six, you've doubled it? I mean, you know. So the second thing I, and I talked about for the mayor, because I know she's from California and I spent some time out there, is the weather's good year-round in, in, in Palo Alto and Stanford and whatnot. We're not in Stanford. We're, we're in New Jersey. We're, we're in, 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 it's cold. All right, so November, parts of November, all of December, January, and all of February. Come on, who's riding bikes out here? Very, very few people right now. All right, some people are. You talk to one, two, three people versus the, you have about 20 people that live in this section of Hamilton Avenue. All right, so what's going to happen is you, once you pass the ordinance, you're going to affect the residents 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Where three, four months, it's too cold to really have a considerable amount of ridership, let alone if it's going to be increased. All right, I'm not going to talk about parking on Stanley and Levin where there are no sidewalks and it's going to make it dangerous for, the, for people with, with children 
and elderly and handicapped to try to cross over. Uh, and as a sergeant would, would tell you, on, on Stanley Avenue, you, you would be required to put a mid-block crosswalk, which isn't advisable, crossing from Stanley over to Hamilton to make it safe. And, it, and on Levitt and Harriet, the, the police officers can tell you, those are both offset intersections. They don't, it's not a T intersection. They're offset intersections. So you have to put crosswalks on both of them. Both are mid-block. Both, both, are, both are offset. And at Levitt and Harriet, there's a bend in the road. Um, also on Harriet, when they redid the street, they only made parking on the one side. All right, so I'm not going to talk about any of this. Uh, I've heard about bicycle lanes in nowhere, but this isn't true. And the reason that is, is because transparency. Council always talks about transparency. What roads? Nobody knows. It hasn't been, been fully disclosed. Where is the transparency? Before the ordinance is passed for a small section of Hamilton Avenue, a complete master plan needs to be presented to the entire Princeton community. And the reason I say this, because tonight, it, I feel as though the, the deck has been stacked, all right? You have, you have a, a few residents on Hamilton Avenue. Now you know that there's only gonna be about 20 residents, because you're only going from Snowden to Harrison on Hamilton Avenue. So you only have about 20 residents. Meanwhile, you brought people, you stacked the deck with a bicycle advocacy groups from all over. And some people don't even live in the town, all right? So you brought people from all over. If you put, put the entire plan out, this room would be overflowing with people one way or the other. All right, the width of Hamilton Avenue with this proposal is not to be changed. We're talking about line striping and shadows. Shadows are currently installed throughout Princeton, allowing for both on-street parking and bicycle riding. This proposal would be a win-win for both residents and bicycle advocacy groups. I strongly suggest council table the ordinance until such time that a complete master plan is presented and there is full transparency. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, I'm uh, Andrew Thomas. I live on Edgestone Road, uh, which I read was one of the roads uh, that was curiously was claimed uh, under consideration for bike lanes in the recent letter in Town Topics. Uh, I can tell you for me too, it would be a, a dream come true if a bike lane appeared uh, outside my front door. But uh, what our street really needs is a sidewalk, if anyone uh, from the committee is here and listening. Uh, there is a high level of uh, pedestrian traffic on our road, and although I would have little use for um, a sidewalk myself, you can install it as soon as you like. Uh, because it would be a pleasure for me to see uh, people able to walk safely down our road. Because uh, it is time that these not-in-my-backyard attitudes we have heard tonight, and are so familiar here in Princeton, came to an end. Uh, this is why uh, you are elected by us all, because you are here to act in the interests of us all. Uh, there will be no winners tonight, because we will be leaving disappointed. Um, as I see it, Council adopted complete streets and then put that policy in the hands of its uh, committees. After much due diligence, these committees returned to Council with unanimous recommendations as to how complete streets should be implemented. Uh, one councillor canvassing his friends and neighbours in order to run a campaign of oppos opposition in the town does not represent reasoned argument and debate. Now, it now seems Council is voting on the matter based on the number of residents who show up to a council meeting and how hysterical they can appear in front of you. Either you are for complete, complete streets or you aren't. After basking in the limelight of complete streets, if this measure is not approved, the town will be a laughingstock among the biking and the wider community who already see Princeton as this pseudo-liberal college town that says one thing but then does another. I urge you to listen to the residents' concerns, to pledge to work on solutions to any legitimate concerns and to approve the bike lane project. I'm sorry if I was rather harsh there. Uh, good evening. My name's Owen Barry. I live in Kingston, but I work in Princeton. Um, I commute by bicycle daily. I don't own a car. I don't have any plans to get a car. Oh, sorry. Um, and I use Hamilton as one of the main routes to and from the center of Princeton to Kingston. In spite of the fact that it's currently so badly paved, it represents a hazard to pretty much all traffic. My coworkers and the people who I meet around Princeton constantly express surprise and a certain amount of fear on my behalf for the cycling conditions in Princeton. They do not feel safe on the roads of Princeton. 
They do not find that the showers offer an effective safety measure and they would feel significantly more secure and they've expressed to me that they would find be more likely to use the roads for cycling if there were dedicated cycling lanes. It's reasonably clear looking at any map of Princeton that there are a number of streets that would be obvious candidates for bike lanes. I think Hamilton is one of them, Prospect uh, another. Both would serve the purpose of drawing cyclists off Nassau Street, which is an unusually hazardous and busy street for cyclists. And uh, I think this proposed bike lane, this proposed segment of bike lane would be a vital first step in developing a comprehensive network of bike lanes around Princeton. I've heard the comments of Hamilton residents. Uh, I've heard reference to increased safety risks from the addition of bike lanes. I have not really heard anything to substantiate these claims. They seem to me a little far-fetched and unlikely. And I also believe that the claims of the residents of the impact of the proposed bike lane are somewhat exaggerated. As someone who uses Hamilton daily, I see very few cars parked along that segment. And I can say that in spite of whatever impact they may have on the speed of traffic up and down Hamilton, they actually render the situation significantly more dangerous for cyclists by forcing them out into the traffic lane. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your time. Hello, my name is William Jones. I live on 273 Hamilton. Uh, I, uh, I walk or bike to work every day, and my daughters both, uh, we take them to school either walking or biking every day. And uh, first of all, I want to thank you for repaving the road. It's better to have a road than no road, and I don't really care what's painted on it. Um, so thank you for that. I also want to thank uh, Patrick Simon for, um, uh, among some of the other residents, for bringing this issue up. But I do feel like there's been a procedural failure here in terms of uh, notifying residents of what's going on. Um, having said that, uh, you know, my feeling on this, as I said, we're heavy users of that road, uh, both as pedestrians and bicyclists. And uh, quite frankly, it's one of the beautiful things about Princeton is being able to bicycle and walk everywhere, and we do. Um, including in the winter. Uh, I, I walked to work this morning. Um, so uh, that said, I don't see much of an improvement that's likely to come from this. I'm receptive to the argument that there should be an overall plan for the town and that the whole community would benefit from having bike lanes. I agree with that. Um, I don't think that installing a bike lane on a small section of road like our own, which arguably doesn't need it, is a good way of doing that. Um, so. Uh, Having said that, you, you face a difficult decision. Um, I'd encourage you to spend your political capital and our financial capital on doing things that will really improve the bicycling situation in town, uh, as well as the standard of living of everybody. Thanks very much. Good evening, <coughs> excuse me. Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. I am Sam Bunting of the Pedestrian Bicycling Advisory Committee and Traffic and Transportation Committee. And I thought it would be helpful if I just could just review the context for why we put forward the recommendation that we did, which it might be helpful for uh, the governing body and also for the members of the public who are here tonight. Um, the proposal for bike lanes is a direct consequence of the town's complete streets policy and also the language of the circulation element of the master plan, which is as follows. Design bicycle and pedestrian facilities to the best currently available standards and practices, including the New Jersey Roadway Design Manual, the AASHTO Guide for the Development of Bicycle Facilities, the AASHTO's Guide for the Planning, Design, and Operation of Pedestrian Facilities, the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, and others as related. So we have reviewed all the standards and guidelines, and it is our judgment that bike lanes fit the best currently available standards and practices. And other alternatives that we considered are not reaching that level. I want to make a specific point about Sharos. With Sharos, there are many opinions, and we aimed to be guided by the published guidelines from the planning and engineering organizations. METCD doesn't set guidelines on what roads are suitable for Sharos, other than to discourage their use on roads with speed limits above 35 miles per hour. On the other hand, the MJDOT bikeway planning and design guidelines specifies minimum lane widths for mixed bike and car traffic based on traffic volumes. These guidelines are based in turn on recommendations from the Federal Highway Administration and are intended to enable safe and orderly traffic flow. 
for a street with traffic volumes equivalent to Hamilton Avenue between North Harrison Street and Snowden Lane. The guidelines recommend a lane width of 14 feet exclusive of parking for mixed car and bike traffic. Now, to achieve that guideline, we either have to widen the road or take out the parking. Right, it's our judgment that if we're going to take out the parking, we should put in a bike lane, which is consistent with the language of the master plan to entice people out of their cars. Now, I realize that the previous policy was to paint shadows in narrow lanes along Hamilton with parking, but that policy was based in a pre-complete streets era. The latest circulation element has complete streets as its centerpiece and seems to call for a higher standard. It will not be possible to achieve this without repurposing some street space for bike facilities. So that we, as a committee, can give you the most useful recommendations on complete streets, it'd be very helpful if members of council could say whether and where we can repurpose space for bike facilities. Opposition to this ordinance would most obviously be interpreted as an indication that you are not willing to repurpose space. And we're in the process now of developing a new bicycle circulation master plan. One of the criteria for judging these applications is a demonstrated commitment to complete streets. Whatever planning effort we do is going to be very different depending on whether or not there is considered to be support for repurposing downtown space to make bicycle facilities on key routes. The creation of a new master plan would obviously involve public consultation, but as you can see from the public comment tonight, there is no obvious consensus. And that is why we are looking for you for guidance on whether and where we can repurpose street space for bicycle facilities. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Daniel Levitch. I live on 278 Hamilton Avenue. Can you say your name a little slower? Because I don't think the clerk's going to be able to get that. My name is Daniel Levitch, D-A-N-I-L-E-W-I-C-Z. -I, -I, I live on 278 Hamilton Avenue for the last uh, 19 years, and we're close to 20, I would say. And uh, apparently, I missed something. I, I think that I didn't know that I live in such a fashionable place that everybody seems to dream of, really dream of coming to uh, Hamilton Avenue from around the Princeton and adjacent streets, adjacent uh, townships. Uh, why? Uh, what's so special about Hamilton Avenue? It's beautiful, but uh, how would you get there, especially those from West, West Windsor? The, on 206, you, you have those chevrons on both sides going up and down. They would have to go there. There's much bigger traffic. Nobody is mentioning any, anything about bike lanes there. And what's best is when you get there, what would you do there? Just walk around, back and forth, ride bike back and forth. And what would you do then? How would you, where would you go from there? dismount your bike and walk because it's too dangerous using uh, chevrons? I just don't understand this. Uh, bike lanes in, sounds really beautiful, but in what expense? What cost? Expense of us living on the street? What cost? I, I have no idea what the budget for this project. And uh, after, afterwards, this street is not going it's not going to be this beautiful anymore. When you take grass strip and put the concrete on it, when you cut down those beautiful centuries old oaks, it's not the same. You said mentioned that we have actually a problem with parking in Princeton right now. We are giving up on parking here on Hamilton. It will increase speed on, on this street. There's no way that uh, one beat. There's problem with uh, speeding cars on Hamilton Avenue right now. Okay. As I mentioned before on last meeting, I, I, I think the perfect solution would be just to put chevrons both ways and repave it because right now it is one pothole on top of another and uh, bump speeds. That would increase the safety. Someone mentioned here that this doesn't work. There's no way this is going to work anymore in this area. I have no idea why. Works perfectly in different places. So uh, if, uh, 
Your agenda is really safety. I will take care of chevrons, speed bumps, sidewalks on adjacent streets, north side of Hamilton would do their job. That's my opinion. Otherwise, I really can't agree with the rest of the proposals. Thank you very much. Good evening, Stephanie Chorney, Ray Street, uh, a resident, uh, environmental commission member and pediatrician. I'm gonna speak tonight very briefly as a pediatrician. Um, I spend my time taking care of children that are sick, but I also spend time trying to keep them healthy. I tell them to not smoke, to wear their seatbelts and to use bike helmets. I hope one day to be able to tell them to uh, use bike lanes, which are by far the safest route anywhere and to school. Uh, I appreciate a lot of the young mothers coming out tonight uh, saying that by, they say by the time that their children go to middle school, they hope that there'll be bike lanes throughout Princeton. Uh, unfortunately, I have a fifth grader who's going to be riding his bike to middle school next year. Uh, right now, he stays on the playground himself, and I, my major concern is that he doesn't talk to strangers on the playground. But by far and away, my major concern for next year is how he's going to get to school safely on his bike. I've already started talking to him about it, and that is my biggest fear that someone's going to open up their car door um, in front of him while he's riding his bike. So I implore you to pass this uh, ordinance in hopes that the rest of Princeton can have bike lanes in the near future. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Jonathan Shore. I live at 447 Walnut Lane. Yeah. Sorry, Jonathan Shore, I live at 447 Walnut Lane. I'd just like to quickly uh, voice my uh, support of this ordinance and hope so that it turns into more uh, a, a larger network over time and that's it thank you hi i'm last i think yeah no i'm not last <laughs> hi my name is velmut van Kamen. i live on 187 hamilton avenue and i have no parking in front of my house uh it does affect me if uh the other section of hamilton does not get any parking anymore because my guests also have to go somewhere. That doesn't particularly face me because I'm also very much in favor of bicycles. I come from the Netherlands and be bike all the time. You know, it's in my blood, it's in my bones. Um, however, looking at this plan, I'm a little puzzled. Um, True bicycle lanes, as I understand them, coming from the Netherlands, are true bicycle lanes. They're separated from the rest of the, of the traffic. You know, so there is a true bicycle lane. That provides true safety. What is happening here, the plan that has been put forward to us, is really not a plan that I think is going to add much safety to the bicyclist. That said, I think it's important that there is a plan. I'm for, I think it's very important that Hamilton is being considered as a particular road where, you know, the safety of bicyclists is going to be um, improved and that the township is really paying attention to that. Um, so I feel a little bit torn. I kind of hope that uh, council will postpone their vote, reconsider the plan, reconsider the effect of shadows on my part of Hamilton Avenue being converted then into bike lanes after a very, very, very dangerous intersection because we don't know what the effect is going to be with all these bicycles having to go through this intersection, particularly when cars are turning there. Many, many cars are turning towards Nassau. Many, many cars are turning towards the shopping center. That intersection is dangerous. What is going to be the effect of these bike lanes, you know, getting to that intersection? I hope that is going to be considered. So what I urge you to do is reconsider the plan, maybe come up with a bigger plan that will include Hall Hamilton Avenue towards the town, towards Wiggins, towards the true center of town so that people really can, can bike there. And um, that's probably all I want to say. So um, I hope you um, reconsider this when you vote and maybe postpone your vote and maybe come up with a better plan. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Barry Royce. Uh, I live at 81 Harriet Drive. The address meant that I didn't get notification of prior meetings 
the mayor actually was kind enough to assure, uh, send me a, a notice on one occasion. Uh, I really would just, I have made some comments which you've all received or hopefully have all received and I'd just like to uh, highlight a few issues which I think are important. I taught actually a course for several years in Princeton to undergraduates uh, about human powered transportation and bicycle infrastructure was an important component of that series of lectures. And so I thought that I should do a little bit of history about Hamilton, Harriet, uh, and all the rest of the uh, street going from Snowden Lane to Route 206. And I find that in uh, 2010, uh, PJBAC uh, suggested sharrows on either side of that road from one end to the other. A significant number were put in uh, up until Harrison Street, but nothing afterwards. I thought that was because the road surface needed redoing, which it has needed for a long time. I don't know. We're now redoing it so we can put sharrows down. The other thing that concerns me is what is the danger of using the road system as it is. The police department was kind enough to give me information for the last five years, and I find that there were three bicycle motor vehicle incidents in more or less the region that we're talking about. Two of those involved no injury and only one of them, uh, that was in 2013, uh, involved an injury. The important thing about all of these though is a point that people have made but not really focused on perhaps, and that is that all of these accidents, uh, dangerous or not, occurred at intersections. And if you put in bike lanes, you've got a real problem still with dealing with an intersection. It's no different than it is with sharrows. You've got to figure out how cyclists are going to leave their bike lane and get into another bike lane in a safe way without the interference of motor vehicles. I'll make a comment here that I believe that sharrows are a better idea because I believe that that very firmly makes the statement that all vehicles using the road have the same rights. And if you've got proper lanes indicated, uh, this can be taken care of uh, at, at intersections as well. Um, I therefore uh, do not favor the ordinance as it is proposed. I would hope that you would reconsider it. I believe the parking is important. You've already stolen it on Harriet Drive by making it too narrow. And now if you take it away on Hamilton, I've got nowhere to park by my house except in my own driveway. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Abhijit Tulasi. It's A-B-H-I-J-E-E-T-H. -E 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 I'm a resident of 200 Hamilton Avenue, and uh, there is no parking in front of my house uh, because my house is on the corner. The road tends to get very narrow because of the left turn. So um, I have to park a little bit ahead, probably a few houses ahead inside Hamilton Street. So it's get very difficult for me to take my car out in the mornings, especially when the traffic is very high. So if you add a bike lane there, I don't know how difficult it's going to get or forget my inconvenience. It's going to really get very hazardous for people driving there. But however, I'm not against bike lanes. I'm not against biking. I really like that. I need people to more bike more. Uh, having said that, at this point of time, I have very little information. I have, there's still a lot of questions that I have that I yet to comprehend. If all this information is already available online, forgive my uh, laziness that I'm unable to research that much, but still, if it's available, then somebody did a good job concealing it there. So, um, having said that, I request the panel that some more time be given to this agenda. Uh, the pros and cons be well presented to the residents of Hamilton Avenue and everybody else in Princeton. And uh, based on that research and based on that information, probably a better educated um, decision be made and voted out. So at this point in time, I'm voting against this uh, ordinance. So I request the panel that 
you present this information and the research and pros and cons to the public. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Jerry Foster. I'm a transportation safety educator for Greater Mercer Transportation Management Association, the uh, NJDOT designated Safe Routes to School Coordinator for Mercer County. I've been working with Princeton in, in, uh, to get a Safe Routes to School uh, infrastructure grants to improve biking and walking conditions so that students can bike and walk safely to John Witherspoon Middle School and to the high school. For example, John Witherspoon Middle School students are currently provided very little in the way of busing, and they are, as a result, either bike or walk, but 50% of them are driven to school every day. This significantly contributes to congestion during the morning rush hour, and that is a, a problem that I think everybody can agree that we would like to uh, reduce. With the question of Hamilton Avenue, bike lanes will help improve the conditions for safety, um, not by themselves and not as a piece, but only if there are bicyclists in the bike lanes. In other words, the safety that all the cities who have improved their bicycling conditions to a significant extent comes from when people get on their bikes, some of them who have never gotten on their bikes in years and years, and get out there and cycling. The motorists, other people, will slow down for them and improve the safety for everyone, mainly for the motorists. So for example, this kind of safety and numbers effect has been observed in cities across the country. I'm just gonna pick out Portland, Oregon, because they've been doing it for a very long time and have lots more statistics than a lot of the other places. Um, but as you might know, fatalities across the country, the fatality rate has been dropping steadily for 30 years. Portland has had a six times greater increase in safety as measured by fatalities than the national average. And that is because they've been implementing bike lanes since the early 90s. The thing about bike lanes is they basically encourage people to bike in a way that sheriffs just do not. Uh, Jeff Speck, the author of Walkable City, says bike lanes basically mint cyclists. So, thank you. My name is Christine Grant, and I'm a resident of Brooks Bend and have lived in this area uh, in Princeton uh, over 30 years now, and I uh, previously submitted last week some comments uh, to the council. So basically, I agree with um, virtually all the very thoughtful comments that have been made as to why it would be premature to push ahead with this particular ordinance. But I stand here tonight as someone who's on her, by herself or, or uh, my husband have traveled this route coming over from uh, the 206 area uh, east to make an egress from Princeton to the north with great familiarity over a number of years of this particular stretch. And after educating myself from the master plan, the bike appendix, the New Jersey manual on bikes, having spent my career in public health and certainly uh, uh, by uh, nature an advocate for what we're trying to accomplish and, accom and uh, congratulating you for that vision and the many bikelists here who do have a vision and aspiration may want to make a couple points. The points are, Policy for complete uh, streets is wonderful and aspirational. It is required before it is implemented that we take additional concrete steps to make sure that when we do implement these policies that we follow our procedures legally and that we, and pragmatically, and that we balance the interest. I'm afraid that uh, as someone who do, doesn't really have a horse in this race, uh, we'll still be able to get out of Princeton in the near future one way or the other, but I don't feel we've taken the adequate steps. I don't feel that we can tie uh, how we got to this particular short stretch as a starting point rather than completing the bicycle plan, identifying particular streets, making sure that we can 
achieve this interconnectivity that people talk about and which I think is a wonderful goal. I don't see it as a taxpayer. I don't see it as, as a traveler in this area. And I just encourage you that as someone looking onto this that I think we risk a bigger problem in going ahead and dividing people further than we do to listen to the pleas and finish up the master plan for biking and identify the streets that are needed and then again have the courage to have this kind of open meeting for the entire community. Thank you. Chris, 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 your comments last week, would you, did you give them to the clerk? I, I don't think I received. I, I gave them to this gentleman to be, to be given to the clerk. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Paul Schuher, 299 Hamilton Avenue, on behalf of my wife and myself, we support Sally Fields. <laughs> Excuse me, but aside from... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but aside from that, I just wanted to draw you one visual comparison of what will happen if we have five-foot bike lanes. If you have parked in the Princeton Shopping Center, you know that the parking width of the parking lot is basically nine foot six inches. Each parking space is about nine foot six inches. That is basically what would be left after a five foot lane is put on either side of Hamilton Avenue. Right now, uh, it, it's, I'm not gonna say any more than that. It's a little dangerous. It'll get even more dangerous. The ideas that I heard tonight, which were really very good, Prospect Avenue, uh, there was even a mention of a mathematical width of 14 feet, which I think is important to consider. And there was also the mention of what happens in Holland and Netherlands, uh, where there's actual physical separation. But I do want you to keep in mind that the width of a parking space in Princeton Shopping Center is 9 foot 6 inches. That's the width that will basically be left for cars traveling at 40 miles an hour along Hamilton Avenue. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak who hasn't had a chance? Okay, seeing none, um, I plan to close the public hearing. And, um, Is it time for us? Yeah, I just, I wanted to um, say one thing first. Um, uh, yeah, I think that the, we can all agree that the process could have been improved um, on this ordinance and, um, you know, clearly we're not perfect and I think we can learn from this to um, you know, make sure the word gets out to neighbors early on in the, um, in the process. But, um, but that said, I have to thank all of you for coming out here tonight. There hasn't been, I don't think, um, as council, I don't think there's been any issue that this council has taken up since we've consolidated that has had more public input than there was here tonight. So, um, you know, we've heard you, certainly I, can, I think we can say at this point that the neighborhood has been heard. The other thing that was really great tonight is I don't think we've ever had so many babies and children come and testify. So um, but it's, uh, it's a nice sight to see. Yeah, I just want to thank, thank everybody for, for showing up and um, uh, speaking your, um, your, your mind um, in regard to th this issue. Uh, it's never easy to, to sit up here, and I know Andrew Kuntz sitting in the audience can, can tell you, and, uh, and make a decision, because you're going to have half the people hate you, half the people like you. Um, you're going to go to McCaffrey, some people are going to speak to you, some people aren't. It's never an easy decision um, whenever you have to sit um, in a local setting and make a decision. Um, I've ridden bikes in Princeton all my life and I'm 52 years old. Um, so for Stephanie, all three of my kids made it to high school. Well, one made it to high school, the other one made it to John Witherspoon, and one makes it to Community Park. And they've always um, arrived there and come back home, uh, thank God, um, safely. Uh, Princeton is a unique community. Um, bicycling is a great thing. Um, I love the bicycle. Um, uh, all my friends bicycle. Uh, I think it's great. Uh, Ron uh, bicycles all the way to Trenton every day, and I just wish I could do that. I'm nowhere near that 
that kind of shape. Um, but it, there's, there's a lot of factors that are in, involved in this, and um, we heard words like this would be, uh, would be setting a president. Uh, we heard words from other people um, stating that uh, if we don't do it, we'll be a laughable community. Uh, we've heard ideas and we've heard thoughts that Princeton isn't serious about uh, protecting their bicyclists. And I can truly say that I'm, I'm serious about protecting everyone. Uh, the people that walk, the people that bicycle, the people that drive their cars, the people that wait for buses. Uh, I really am serious about protecting all. Um, the way that I would like to do this, and I'm just one vote, I'm one person. That's all I am here. But I would like to um, propose to table this, this ordinance. And what I think is a fair, I, fair way to do this is to have a bike master plan completed and one with a date actually completed. And have a bike master plan completed where we have the, the input. Um, I, I know that I've heard, I've heard uh, the context that a lot of people weren't notified. Um, and I want, want to apologize that we have one of the best engineering teams um, in the state. And it was nothing, nothing done intentionally at all um, for, for that to happen at all. Um, and I want to apologize if anybody thought that anything was done underhandedly, and that definitely was, was not a fact at all. Um, but, for, but what I would like to do is, as I mentioned before, I would like to table this ordinance. I would like to com complete, have a, a, a bike master plan completed. And during that time, I would, allow, I would love for the parking to remain the way it is, but if at all possible, to put a bike lane on the other side. Um, and that's something that we've spoken to the um, um, engin engineering departments about. And that's something that can be done um, to foster the idea that we do need uh, bike lanes um, in Princeton and to promote bike lanes in Princeton. But to have total um, bike lanes on this street at this time, for me, uh, just, just wouldn't work. But like I said, I'm just one vote, and that's, that's how I feel. So thank you. Uh, can, yeah, can I ask just a process question? Um, uh, uh, Councilman Lerman, are you proposing, uh, or I guess I should say, how, do, how would that work? Do, if we table it, are we sort of leaving it out there in the ether sort of indefinitely? Should our process be to essentially Vote it down now with the commitment to reconsider it if the master if the bike master plan says that it should be reconsidered. And I, uh, yes, yeah, you and I, I talked about this earlier, and yeah. I think these, these they're both getting at the same direction. So we just want some legal guidance on what we should do. Yeah. And, and let me just add to that a question too: Can the repaving go ahead? Because I think we've heard from the community can. Oh yeah, the, the repaving can. Yeah, the, the, the ordinance that's in front of you is solely about whether or not to prohibit parking on the south side of, of Hamilton. So, it's that's independent of repaving, creating a bike lane on the north, etc. Procedurally, you can do either one. You can either vote the ordinance down, in which case it's dead, and then at some future time you reintroduce it or introduce something new, or you can table it. And the answer is yes, if it's tabled, because I checked on this before the meeting, it remains tabled until a motion is made by somebody to untable it and put it up for a vote. So that means it would, in essence, be out there prior to adopting it, were it to come up for adoption, you would have to give notice again to the public because you wouldn't be actually carrying this to a specific date. And then if it were back on an agenda for adoption with proper notice to the public, then a motion would have to be made to untable it. Okay. So then related to that, uh, could I ask, I don't know if the council, Howard, if you'd be comfortable answering this, or maybe uh, one of the representatives from the uh, Ped Bike Committee. Um, at the completion of the Bike Master Plan, do you expect the ordinance we'd need to be just this segment, or do you expect it to be something probably larger than that? covering more of Hamilton, because if so, I, I think what we would probably recommend is vote it down at this time with commitment to consider whatever is approved in the plan. Well, I have a question actually for engineering on that then. So, I mean, the reason why we're doing this stretch is because there's a road reconstruction project on it. So would the recommendation be when we have the bike master plan and say there's recommendations in the bike master plan to put in bike lanes where there's currently parking? Would our procedure be to 
automatically remove parking on all those streets or would we wait until we're doing the repaving or reconstruction project? The way we've handled this uh, uh, in the past is we consider these type uh, issues, the complete street issues and so forth, on a case-by-case -case basis as the roads are improved. Now, segments of roads can be improved, and if there's a missing link in between, that certainly could be considered because what we're talking about in terms of bike lanes is just simply restriping the roads. It's uh, the road is in good shape. We could eradicate the lines and then and then restrip re restripe. So in response, generally we look at these type of things when the road is to be reconstructed or resurfaced, but it could be considered at other times as well. I, oh, sorry. Uh, I, I thought, um, just, just to uh, follow up on that, when the Shadows report came out in 2010, what did we do? Did we wait and do it segment by segment, or did we um, put down the Chevrons all uh, sort of in a larger batch? We put them down uh, all at the same time, and they weren't, and the work was not done in conjunction with repaving of the roads. And, and your, your previous answer is we could do that again with bike lanes. Correct. Um, thank you. I mean, I think this is, I want to thank Lance for proposing what seems like a reasonable solution to me for now. I mean, I think I would support tabling. I think that's a better option, clearly a better option than voting it down, because voting it down, I think, sends the message that we don't ever want to get there. And I, that's not where I am. I think we want to send the message that um, we're doing what we can now. We understand that this has been a complicated process, and, it, and, and as the mayor said, maybe not the process we would have wanted, but we'd be sending the message that we have a serious commitment to creating a bike master plan, and then I would hope, similarly, a serious commitment to following through on that bike master plan um, when it comes through. And I, you know, I, let me, I, did, I do just want to step back and echo, Lance, your comments that um, I think we've learned a lot in this pro about the process here and we've raised awareness and I'm glad that so many people have felt comfortable coming forward uh, and it's really important for us to thank the citizens who have spent so much time on this I'm a new member of the P of the PBAC but uh, I've been so impressed with the work they've been doing and the lesson I've learned already in this short time is that complete streets is easy in concept and hard in application right and um, we saw that with Poe Road when everyone who lived on Poe Road said we're elderly we don't have kids who are walking to the school why do we need sidewalks and we said we have to step back and think about the entire community and we have to think about who might live on Poe po Road 25 years from now. Um, and that was obviously a difficult conversation we had. Um, but what I'm glad is that there seems to be a consensus about the importance of a bike master plan and I'm hearing that from everyone. And so, um, and, and I'm glad because I think we clearly need one. And But the reminder is that planning is hard and following through, it's easier in concept than in, than in, than in implementation. So I, I think the way, I think what you're proposing, Lance, is that we table it, the work continues for everyone who's worried, you know, the, 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 yeah. the road gets improved, yes. um, nothing is held up on that front. We would implement a bike lane on the one side where there is currently no parking. Um, the parking would remain on the other side, but we would, be in earnest, be pursuing a bike master plan. And I, I would encourage our representatives to the, uh, Jenny's not here, but to the mayor, to the, to the planning board, to see what we can do to coordinate. That has not yes. worked as well in the past as it should, the work that's been done on bike planning and how we coordinate that with the overall master plan. And then I want to publicly state, and hope, hope others will join me, that we will have a serious com commitment to implementing a bike master plan if we're you know, we heard a complaint that we didn't that we didn't we didn't have a process well let's have a process and let's be serious about it uh, thank you process uh, just another process question the, the proposal was to table this and I avoided seconding it because I want to make sure I understand the implications of that does that cut off discussion it, as soon as it's seconded don't we then have to vote on it the, the, yeah, but we don't no, want a motion to table is usually yes, non-debatable. Yes, yes. Motion, <laughs> right. motion, motion to table. table is non-debatable. So, I mean, I think you're right. I'm happy to second it, but I also did it. Can we have a conversation before we do that? I want to have a little conversation that. about the issue, and so I'm... Right. And, and I want to... Uh, yep. uh, all right, so so the, the conversation is in terms of what I think we're suggesting, if I understand correctly, and correct me if I got it wrong, is what has been uh, discussed described as option number two in the menu of options that we received, which is a bike lane on one side, preserved parking on the other side, 
And that option included putting shares in. Is that acceptable on that side? Or are you asking them to explicitly not put that in? And if so, I guess we'd need guidance on that. I, I wouldn't put the share. I, I don't know. I, 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 my inclination would be not to, to wait for the Mike Master Plan, because I think we've heard enough. Um, well, what would be the timeline on the bike master plan? Bike master plan, and what would be the cost of the sharrows? Because if they are helpful, even for a short amount of time, they don't seem to last very long. So they'll come off on their own. Do you have any idea what that would be? I believe Deanna uh, calculated the cost of striping of roughly eight thousand dollars. That's for that's for all striping, which would be the center line striping. Um, like lane striping. Oh, really? $8,000? Eight, $8, or was that the sharrows, though? I think the sharrows are more expensive. Uh, they were about, weren't they? If, 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 if you did sharrows just on one side, it, we're First probably one. talking about uh, $2,500, plus or minus. Is that what you remember? So, I thought they were a little bit more expensive than that, just, but that's completely my recollection from the time. I have a concern day. about putting uh, the bike lane on one side without the sharrows on the other side, because I think if we put the bike lane on one side without the sharrows, we're requiring people to make a diagonal crossing at uh, Harrison Street in order to get into the bike lane or out of the bike lane. And, and uh, I think that Tabling the motion, I can agree with. I can support that. But uh, I would like to see if we're going to put a bike lane on the north side, where there's no parking at the present time, that we accompany it with sharrows on the other side. Uh, yeah. I mean, pending the cost of it. I, I have some, actual, some questions to ask about some of the comments that were made this evening and some of the things that I've been thinking about. Um, I happened to be down in Philadelphia late last week, and they've... I think the person who did the bike master plan here in, to, in the early 2000s or whatever also has gone to Philadelphia and done a lot of the work down there. And so in my old neighborhood on Spruce and Pine, what they did was um, not eliminate a lane of park, not eliminate the parking, but they eliminated a lane of traffic and turned the lane of, so it was, there were two tiny lanes of, of uh, traffic, but it is one directional. Have we looked at the possibility of doing more one-way streets and so we can accommodate the bike lanes so we don't, because I think some people were under the misimpression that we were going to widen the street and take down trees, et cetera. I heard some of that. That that option is off the table because of the expense of it. But I wondered if when we looked at the bike plan, and maybe maybe the bike plan could consider that, and maybe we would want to put some of the traffic direction on the table so we could accommodate, um, we could come up with bike lanes safely and still have parking because there are some areas that are more residential and would need the parking, um, but not have two directional traffic. Um, so that's one question. The other, um, can I just respond to that really briefly? I yeah. know, um, and I can't remember where I saw this, but I know there was some plan done at some point, um, and it was in the former borough of one-way streets to accommodate um, bike lanes, and I'm not sure if that was part of the Carmel plan or something else, but I think it does raise the question, it's like, this municipality and the previous township and the previous borough have spent thousands of dollars on previous studies. And I think this begs the question is, you know, I don't want to send the pedestrian and bike advisory committee and the planning board down a path of a lot of time and a lot of work and public money because you can see them, it's like people are getting jaded because they don't want to create another study that looks great on paper that there's not the political will to implement. So I think that, you know, I understand the desire to table it and I understand, um, you know, why there's, um, you, you know, why people don't feel comfortable voting yes tonight on this, but if there's never going to be a parking spot that we're going to be willing to say, a bike lane is more important than the parking spot ever anywhere in town, then I think we have to be honest and own up to that and give that direction because the bike plan is going to look really different. And maybe then you end up with one-way streets, 
right? Or you, you're, you're, you're much more limited. But I just, I feel like in fairness to everybody who's involved, it's we have to say what we're willing to potentially do. Okay, if I could continue. I, 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 wasn't, I, I wasn't saying <laughs> that I would not ever eliminate parking, believe me. I, I do buy into the idea that this is a public right of way and it is um, important for the greater good if we think that bike lanes are the greater good. But I'm just saying, I don't know why the 2002 plan was not ever adopted by the master plan. Um, but I'm just putting it out there as an alternative that I haven't heard considered that crossed my mind when I was driving around Philadelphia um, late last week. I also wanted, um, I don't know the answer to the question about uh, people who have concerns about service vehicles coming. And there, there sort of seemed to be the suggestion that they could just park in the bike lane for some period of time. And I don't think that's, I don't think that's correct, Sergeant Murray. Can you, I, I mean, you can't just sometimes park in the bike lane if you need to. The way the mechanism that we have in place to accommodate residential requests like that, which are, are not uncommon, in fact, they're probably more common than anybody realizes, uh, especially on tight streets such as Bank Street, uh, areas where there's a lot of um, seasonal move-ins and then move-outs at the end of the school year. Um, as traffic safety officer, I'm put in a predicament where I have to extend or grant parking in some circumstances where parking is not regularly allowed. To be quite honest with you, I do not like doing that because I assume responsibility for having that vehicle parked there at that time, anything that might happen. So um, it, is it necessary to do? By all means, yes, it is. Uh, people have to move in. People have to, to move out. People have to have uh, contractor and service vehicles uh, park within close proximity of their residences. And this is, is one of my concerns as far as this ordinance, potential ordinance is concerned, and, and it has been expressed before. And I, I think we've also heard it here from a lot of the Hamilton Avenue residents themselves. Joe, do you um, want to ask a related question? Because we heard, related to this, we heard from um, a resident whose parents are elderly and, and um, disabled. And there was the question of, I, I thought you and Deanna had met with the family, and there was a question of whether disabled parking could occur. It, well, if this, if this ordinance were to pass, and that, that need, which I feel has been conveyed to the engineering department and has been conveyed to me, um, we would have to do our best to accommodate handicapped parking in that situation. So we would therefore have to pursue an ordinance to put a handicapped parking stall in there, which would in fact, you would create a conflict. Can I, so I don't know if this is actually your area of expertise or whether you can answer. Do you, we've heard that there's a lot of parking on, need for parking on Hamilton and then not so much need, but if the parking lane is, if the parking is largely empty, then it, it sort of begs the question of how much extra safety would a bike lane provide. Do you, do you ever, is it ever done that you would have a, uh, like, a bike lane but that had parking on certain hours so you wouldn't have um, parking during rush hour, times when kids might be going to school, there, but at there, other times of day when there's not there, as much. There certainly are possibilities, but then again, I, I think we're going to be we're going to get back to square one, where you're you're never going to be able to meet everybody and accommodate everybody's needs. So, for lack of better words, I think you're spinning your wheels there. Anytime you have a, uh, implement something that uh, requires uh, a time ordinance, that requires extra enforcement action. It, and, and unless it's enforced on a regular basis, it, it does not garner the respect that it deserves, and, and you'll continue to have problems. Um, I, I, at this point in juncture, I, I wouldn't necessarily favor that, uh, only because I would favor consistency. And then can you also comment on the idea of those mid-block crossings and those the streets that don't... Line well, it, it, that it's certain that if we ban parking in, on, on this section of Hamilton Avenue, and just for record keeping purposes between Harrison Street and, and Snowden, that um, parking, potential parking, will be transferred to the side streets. There's no question about that. 
And we've heard tonight that, no, we do not have statistics, uh, concrete statistics to say how much of that parking will be transferred to the side streets. And we don't know which side streets. One could argue that most people that would be displaced would go to the area, the closest area where they could legally park. And in that situation, we'd be talking about Levitt, Stanley, depending on whatever section that person resides at on Hamilton Avenue. But if you can now park along, let's say, the uh, eastbound side of Hamilton, which is legally allowed right now for ordinance, if you remove that and you displace somebody over to Stanley, Fisher, or Levitt, then most certainly I'm going to have to be concerned about more pedestrian traffic crossing Hamilton Avenue In than, the I, block. than I had to previously. Um, I have one more question for Deanna. Deanna, could you talk a little bit about where we are with um, the step that would take our complete streets from m more theory to actual uh, guidance for implementation? Um, after the policy was adopted as part of the master plan document, uh, we did look at how to take policy into implementation. Uh, the idea was that the capital improvement projects that um, we're discussing now, Hamilton and then Prospect and Mount Lucas, were the first projects that would fall under complete streets. So we would be looking at those as a demonstration project of different types of complete streets, how we could implement it in a context sensitive way in town. Uh, but at the same time, we were working on putting together a checklist that we would be using uh, when we evaluate each of our capital improvement projects and putting together a traffic calming library which would give us options of, of things that we could do then to put into the streets to help with that. So we do have a draft document that was completed last summer. Uh, it's on for the Traffic and Transportation Committee and I to work on uh, moving that ahead in this first quarter of 2015 into more of a working document rather than a, a draft document. Um, and back last year, we did meet with emergency services initially and uh, fire and rescue to get some of their input on it, those traffic uh, calming devices. So we, we have draft documents. They are not complete documents. Uh, the idea is that this will be a process that's evolving. We'll have the, the demonstration projects. We have these two documents that we're working on. And that we, we will be going through the process with public input on each of the, the capital projects to get more feedback and to get lessons learned and to figure out what works and doesn't work in town. Um, I have been to quite a few seminars on the matter. And uh, just on Saturday, I went to the New Jersey and Bike and Walk uh, summit and I was speaking with Passaic County's assistant planner and he said it has taken them three years through to get to a point with the implementation of their complete streets plans to, to have it be something that it's a very fluid process where a road comes up for resurfacing they know how to treat it because they've already worked out for that type of a street with engineering with all of the different groups as to what the appropriate treatment is. So a county is definitely different from a municipality, but it is a process. And that, that's why I say that, to show that it will take us time to get through this. But we are working on those other steps to, to help bolster our complete streets policy. Will that be something that comes to council for approval, or will that be kind of an engineering the goal document. was to bring it through the planning board oh, okay. to have it actually adopted as something um, as part of the, the planning board master plan. 
But it would mean that even if we had a bike plan and a street was identified as a bike plan street, uh, or, you know, as a bike plan street, thank you, uh, by part of the bike network, thank you, Liz, um, that wouldn't ne does that necessarily mean that we would have a bike lane on that street or it's on a case-by-case -case basis? No, I think in that case, if you do have a bike master plan, I would hope that it would um, describe the treatment that should be done for that portion of the network. Because again, there's all different sorts of roads, like Prospect Avenue is proposed as a, a bike boulevard. Uh, Hamilton has come to you as bike lanes. Mount Lucas is side path and bike lane and share. It's a hybrid of all options. So um, I'm hoping that, that this bike master plan, which would go through community input and um, an oversight that it would come forward with the recommendation for the type of treatment for that portion of the network. Okay. I do have a statement from Jenny. I don't know if, can I read it? It's just a paragraph. Um, she said, uh, sorry to miss the meeting tonight. If anyone wants to know my position in a nutshell, it's that I support removing parking in favor of bike lanes on selected roads in Princeton. What has changed since I supported the introduction of this particular ordinance is that I have become convinced that doing only a small portion of Hamilton without a commitment to do it elsewhere is not a good idea process-wise. We should be taking on the whole bike plan, or at least a larger piece of it, especially the rest of Hamilton. It's going to be even more controversial to take away parking on other longer stretches of roadway, but that's a decision we need to make. I want to reiterate that I believe that the public right-of-way is for the use of the general public and is not, and it is not unreasonable to use it for bike travel. I support removing parking to create a larger network of dedicated park lanes. And I, I concur with that sentiment. So, I, I mean, so Mayor, I think, I think that's great. Thank you. Please thank Jenny for writing that from probably a hospital, <laughs> from a waiting room. Um, I mean, I think that's great because I think, Mayor, what you were channeling and what I've heard from members of the PBAC and from TNT is they do need direction. A lot of, a lot of time, a lot, our staff has spent a lot of time, our terrific staff, I should say, has spent a lot of time on these issues and we have a lot of volunteers spending time and um, they need to know that there is um, a commitment um, to following through if we, if we adopt these these um, best practices in terms of planning and so I'll, I'll add my name to that that I know there are going to be times when it's painful but um, um, we have to think about our commitment to the entire town and current and future residents and there are going to be times when um, we're going to need to do that and um, it, if the bike master plan recommends that and this comes back before us I would support it I think it's very <laughs> difficult to uh, consider one small element out of the context of the whole. And I think that all of us would be in a better position to consider what we've been talking about on the 2,000 feet of Hamilton if we had a better picture of how it integrated into the whole. And for that reason, I strongly support the idea of coming up with a bike master plan, but I don't underestimate the difficulty of doing that. I think master planning is, is a very difficult job it's time consuming. It's difficult to get public input when you're at the level of doing a master plan. Uh, very often the uh, people who are involved in doing the planning meet during the daytime and many of the people who are here this evening aren't available to come to meetings during the daytime. And uh, it is a difficult time consuming process, but when we're all done, if we can get to the point of a master plan, at least we can see how the pieces fit together, and then make a, a, a more consistent, more logical process that leads to a decision. OK. Um, I, 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 I would second Lance's motion. I guess, I mean, I don't want to cut off any, didn't look like anybody wants to come in. I don't want to cut off the debate if the folks have more. Is there anybody else? Patrick, like did you want to say anything? anything? Or? Uh, I, I would like to say just a few words briefly, if I could. Um, in weighing this issue from the start, uh, I've been uh, wrestling with several con uh, commitments which frankly are in conflict with each other at some level. One is uh, the complete streets policy and the commitment that the t town made 
to improve pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure. And that is very clear. I also agree with the uh, analysis done by PBAC that in general bike lanes are safer uh, overall. Um, it, conflicting with that, um, in, uh, in actually in direct conflict with that, is the, um, the element of complete streets which uh, basically says you plan and then do. And that's not what we did this time around. We don't have a full plan yet. And the, uh, it's important that we, uh, that we work on the, the plan and then uh, work through it. And in terms of the plan, in addition to the challenge, just in terms of the, um, what's going to be uh, difficult or easy to implement politically, the, the, the thing I would like to encourage people to be very clear-eyed on is what's the real uh, benefit and what are the real costs, and, and to understand those. Um, and, and to be very open with respect to that. Uh, we heard tonight from residents that it's an inconvenience, it's a significant inconvenience to them, and we heard that it's an especially difficult inconvenience to seniors. So one of the other things that's in conflict for me with respect to this, pro in this process, is we just won an award for being a senior-friendly community. And we've heard people tell us that this is gonna make it difficult for them to age in place. There may be a time when we weigh those two and it's very clear that the bike network value to the community overall is there. Having a single segment is not really the time where I can, I can look at that and say that I, I can see the value in the network there. And, and I really struggle with the, and in fact, I was not able to accept the argument that people made that if we don't do it now, we'll never do it. I completely disagree with that. We have a commitment to implement complete streets. We have a com commitment to improve pedestrian infrastructure and bike infrastructure. And the, the process, the, the complete streets is, is frankly a complete policy. It includes the planning side of it. It includes the public debate side of it. It includes the transparency side of it that is really uh, missing here. And, and I guess I should explain that. We just passed in, uh, not we, the planning board just passed in November of 2013 a circulation element, uh, a revised circulation element of the master plan. It does include complete streets. It also includes a map of where the bike uh, uh, infrastructure is and what's proposed as changes. And it includes a text description of the proposed changes. And this segment's not on it. Four months later, the committee is talking about putting bike lanes on this. There, there is a transparency and accountability problem for us as a community with that timeline. And I, I see you shaking your head, but that is the timeline that we followed. We also, to back up further, we had a warning from a member of the Ped Bike Committee in 2012 that this would happen. Jan Bennett sent a memo to the mayor indicating that it was important that the bike plan be done in 2013 and be part of the circulation element of the master plan. And she also discouraged putting effort into the award that we received because it was from an advocacy group and it's not nearly as meaningful as real concrete work on complete streets. We have tried to do all of it we need to prioritize our efforts on the highest value to the community. And right now, that is to focus on the plan. It's, I agree with Council President Miller, it is going to be a difficult process because you're going to get both the advocates and the people opposed to it on the full plan coming out. But that's frankly what we have to do to work through this. And I do want to uh, thank and encourage the members of the Ped Bike Committee and the members of the Traffic and Transportation Committee and also the members of our staff who have put in so much effort uh, on, on this. And I want to thank, uh, I want to agree with the mayor and thank all of the people who came out today, uh, uh, whatever side of the issue you, you came out and discussed on. The, the fact that um, you expressed, uh, that you voted with your feet to come out here, that you told us that it's a priority for you that we hear your voice on this issue is, uh, matters to us. And it's very difficult on many issues for council to get an accurate gauge of the community. Uh, much of the time, we are using our best judgment. And you've helped us give a lot of feedback on both sides. 
and it's important to us and it has helped us clarify the issues that we need to consider on this. Thank you. Ms. Howard? Yeah, I'd just like to um, pick up on the, the theme of transparency and encourage everyone to check out the Ped Bike um, website on our main website. And as I said, I, I, I'm new to the being the liaison, so I have to admit that I had not checked it out before. I was, I was the liaison. And there's a lot of great stuff here because there's so much great work going on. And I'm sorry Steve just left because um, he, put his, he puts his heart into this and there's a lot, a lot of stuff here. These meetings are all open to the public. They're all noticed. We're meeting Thursday at 7.30, right? So um, maybe there'll be renewed interest in, um, in the work. But there, it, there's a lot of good work. And I'm sorry. I, I know there's a feeling some people feel like their work has been discounted. And certainly, um, I don't think that that's not the case um, from my perspective here. There's been a, lo a lot, a lot of hard work here. And it will not be in vain. Um, it will not be in vain. So. Um, and I guess I just wanted to clarify, there's been a lot of things said about complete streets. And um, you know, I agree with the desire to have a bike master plan. But you don't need to have a bike master plan in order to enact complete streets. Um, this is a policy that is endorsed by the federal government. I don't think they have a master plan for all of the federal roads. It's been endorsed by the state of New Jersey. Complete Streets has been endorsed by Mercer County. And it's also been um, uh, endorsed by the former township, the former borough, and now the consolidated municipality. And what it says is, and it is a change of policy. If you look around, we don't have any bike lanes. And um, you know the sharrows are better than nothing, but the former policy before we had complete streets was we build our roads for cars. And if there's room, we'll put in a sidewalk. And if there's room, we'll put in a bike lane. And this is hard in Princeton because our roads are not that big. And we don't want to make them bigger because we love our trees. And so I think Ms. Howard said, you know, it's true. It's like this is a great policy in theory. And when you actually try to practice it, it's really difficult. And you see us struggling up here. And I think if everybody takes a step back, it's like they realize that everybody in this room made fair arguments and made fair points and is coming to this problem honestly. And it's just something's got to give sometimes. And what Complete Street says and what we've said we're going to do is that we're not going to start with the cars and say, let's make everything work for the cars. And then if it's not working for these other groups, then, well, it's too bad. It's we have to come to the table and look at everybody and say, is this road working for everybody? Um, so I, you know, I appreciate I want to thank Mr. Liverman for um, you know, some sort of compromise for tonight. Um, and um, you know, I would encourage council to, um, to at least try to get um, one bike lane and maybe let engineering figure out. It, it, the way the ordinance is written, it's really just impacting the parking. So um, we can, I don't think we need to have a formal vote on the, the rest of it. Um, but I, I do think it's important to, to start with, um, to start with some bike lane. I think um, I agree with what's been said here tonight about um, uh, that's the beginning. And I think it shows our commitment to, to trying to do more. And I've heard from all of my colleagues, and I'm proud to hear from all my colleagues that, that there is a, a desire to see more. If I, if I could add um, one more thing, just for clarification, Ms. Stockton, the, um, one of the clauses in the Complete Streets policy is to establish a procedure to evaluate resurfacing projects for Complete Streets inclusion according to length of project, local support, environmental constraints, right-of-way limitations, funding resources, and bicycle and, and or pedestrian compatibility. I assume that's the section of complete streets that you're essentially answering with the checklist. Is that a correct understanding, either Mr. Kaiser or Ms. Stockton? Yes, that would be part of it. it it's uh, section number five uh, under the section of policy, which is uh, Roman numeral four, complete streets. Right, the establish a procedure to evaluate resurfacing so projects. That, that's precisely what you're telling us you're working on, right? Yes, okay. That is it. There, there's another 
um, section which I haven't heard addressed yet and which I, I believe you should also work on because it'll help us in terms of establishing value for the community, establish performance measures to gauge success, which is section 13. And the implications of that are we're going to need some measures of current state and future state. And that, that I think is actually going to be the toughest part. We have the traffic data, but I don't think we have a lot of pedestrian or bike data that is good. And so I encourage you to, to start kind of creatively thinking of how we're going to address that aspect of it as well. And this is part of what I meant when I said the complete streets is complete. It's complete in a lot of ways, the entire policy. It's not just about it's not just about safety, it's also about the process to actually achieve the implementation. And it includes the planning, it includes the accountability, and it includes the measures afterwards. And, and so I, I wanted to add specifically that you look at uh, that section, number 13, on the performance measures. Yes, we are looking at three and five. Three actually lists the establish a checklist uh, specifically and then five is the procedure. You are definitely correct about the performance measures. Um, and just to also give a little more information on that one, um, there are many towns that have complete streets policies, have bike master plans, and don't do any counts to gauge the success of those. So no, we definitely take that in consideration. Um, I will be reaching out with our bike ped group to see if we can get volunteers, hopefully through safe routes to school discussions with the school district, finding high school volunteers possibly that can help us do counts, summer interns, so we're, we're definitely looking at uh, different ways to count both pedestrian or pedestrians, bicycles, and vehicles. Has state DOT been any help in answering these kinds of questions as you sort through how to implement complete streets? They have. They have. Actually, the Bike of Pedestrian um, group has a great outreach throughout the country. And so they are able to reach out through blogs and other means to put questions out there and get feedback for us. So like the question on the um, ADA accessible parking space in a bike lane, they were able to put that out for me and get feedback on it. So, so yes, they're a great resource for us. Can I ask a question, do, and do they have a way, we heard a lot about people would turn out to bike if, there, if they, there were lanes, if they felt safer. I mean, when you're looking at trying to create, come up with data, how, it, it, can you factor, how do you factor that in, this increase that might be there if you were to do, put, put in the lanes? There is data out there for the towns that count. Uh, it's just a matter of culling that. Uh, but you also have to consider that you have different levels of users, as we're all aware of. There's people that don't feel comfortable no matter what you do. Right. I think I saw a statistic, there's like approximately 66% of the population that you might be able to encourage to cycle if you do bike lanes. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep doing our research and our outreach with the state and other organizations. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate my last point again about like about having a master plan is a good idea, but we do have a lot of road projects coming up that are likely going to be the bike the backbone of any bike network, and so I think we should just be aware of the issues with that so you know I know that pedestrian bike looks at that big project that happened downtown with Park and Moore Street and that was in a lot of ways a lost opportunity um, to think about bike infrastructure on those streets we're going to be doing um, um, Prospect Avenue we've heard Mount Lucas Valley Road all of those streets are prime biking streets. So I would just caution, um, you know, what we're saying tonight about needing a bike master plan. I don't think that we should put off complete streets 
entirely. I think we still have to think about every time we do a road project, even before we have the master plan adopted, how can we make sure this is going to be safe for all users? This can't be an excuse to, to, not, to not implement. I, I agree. The next time a pro road comes up, we can't use that as an excuse. Yeah. But pro road was on the master plan. That, that's what made it yeah, easier. easier to vote in favor of that, even though we heard considerable um, hardship being imposed by creating that sidewalk. So um, having the master plan and having it ha gone through a process where our, we've gathered the appropriate input does make it easier at this level. Uh, no, Mayor, are you proposing a, a working session or are you, um, it, it's expecting us to start, sort of start through and come up with guidelines in the absence of sort of the planning process? I mean, we can try it if that's what you're.